I've kind of changed direction just a little bit on the message today since uh, I was getting ready to you know you kind of plan out how you want to go and uh, I was going to deal with the omniscience of God and the omnipresence of God the all-knowingness of God and the holiness of God and God said no you need to preach on the fire of God this morning it, it's apropos when Shavuot or Pentecost starts tonight at sunset we need to learn guys we need to learn how to dwell in the fire of God we need to learn how to dwell in it as we were worshiping this morning God began to show me a couple of things and I thought it was interesting I I saw uh, the temple of God and there was no fire in the holy of holies and what was interesting is as the fire began to burn in the streets of Jerusalem began to flow water and the hotter the fire got the more water began to flood the streets talking about the farmer in the latter rain. That as we allow the fire of God to burn in our hearts, the water of the Holy Spirit begins flowing in our lives. Because how many know this, this world is starving? This world is, is thirsty for a true move of God. We have gotten tired of the sugary, syrupy drink of the world that's been trying to be propagated for many of the churches. The devil tries to take his stuff and put enough sugar in it. He thinks everybody will drink it. I want, the, I want the living water of God in my life. And so we're going to deal this morning with the fire of God. If you have your Bibles, I want to start in Deuteronomy chapter 4, starting with verse 10. I'm amazed at how many Pentecostals don't know that after the resurrection of Jesus, that wasn't the first Pentecost. The first Pentecost started way back with Moses at Mount Sinai. And there, there, there is a connection between Moses and that Shavuot and the one that came when the Holy Spirit was giving. There is a connection. There is a purpose. There is a power. There is a wisdom behind it. And if we miss that connection, we miss the whole mark. We have too many Pentecostals that talk in tongues, that speak in tongues, but have no power. Right. I'm tired of the blah, 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 and have no fire, any fire, fire, fire. <laughs> I want more of the lip service. Let's pick up here at verse 10. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. Now, we've been studying on the names of God and this is Yahweh Elohim, the balance of God. You stood before God in grace, and we have found Messiah encoded in the Tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav -Heh, that the Talmud teaches us that, that Yahweh talks about the grace of God, the love of God, and Elohim talks about the judgment of God, that God is creator. He has a right to judge. And as they stood before God at Mount Sinai, God appeared to them as the balance of grace and justice. And we've got to understand that you cannot move in the fire of God. You cannot move in the power of God if you're imbalanced. And it's interesting to me that the old Pentecostals, the old ones that used to really move in the power of God, they spoke a lot about the judgment and the justice of God. And the power of God began to flow. But as we have become sugary sweet with all grace and no judgment, the power of God has dwindled down to nothing. Because we have become imbalanced. And it said, when the Lord said unto me, gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, and that, may, that, they, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall be upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And ye come near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire until, until the midst of heaven with darkness and clouds and thick, and the, excuse me, thick darkness. Now, I want you to notice what it says here in verse 12. And the Lord spake to you out of the midst of the fire. The Lord spake to you out of the midst of the fire. One of the reasons that we have, we have a, a drought of hearing God. Now, I mean, know there's, there's a lot of blabber going on, but there's not a lot of hearing God is because we don't want him to speak out of the midst of the fire. We want him to speak out of the midst of the syrupy grace. God doesn't speak out of syrup. You'll not find one place that God says, go grab a sugar cane and wave it and I'll speak out of it. He says, I speak out of fire. That's right. 
And the true voice of God comes today in the fire. And so we need to have that connection. If I want to hear God really hear him, I've got to embrace the fire. If people are talking about hearing God without the fire, they're not talking about hearing God. They're listening to another spirit who cannot come in fire. I want you to think about that for a minute. Go back to Mount Carmel. Now, sometimes the devil can, can try to appear in fire until God really shows up. How many of the prophets of Baal were shocked and, and amazed at Mount Carmel that no fire fell when they called because there was a representative of the kingdom of God there and that within his bosom was the fire of God. And when God's fire shows up, their little bick just don't work. And there's coming a time, my friend, when the days that we're living at now, that God's fire is getting ready to return to his people. And as it does, Baal is going to stop speaking in the church. Right now, Baal speaks. It's, it's almost like the days of Elijah. Baal speaking more in the church right. than the Holy Spirit is. That's right. <laughs> but the Lord spake to you out of the midst of fire, and ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no, no similitude. But ye heard a voice, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon the tablets of stone. Now look at verse, now listen, we're, we're, we're talking about some things here. God spoke out of fire, he established his covenant. We're, we're going to see this in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. God spoke out of fire and established his covenant. God can't establish his covenant if you don't let him speak out of fire. When, all, when the Almighty came and cut a covenant with Abram and he laid out the, the, the animals, God appeared in fire and moved through the animals as he cut the covenant. You can't have the covenant without the fire. That's good. That's good. Well, just think about that. Why do I want the fire? Because I want the covenant in force. Now look here at verse 14. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that. To teach you statutes and judgments, the commands of God. Yeah. Why did you have to do them? That ye may do them in the land whether thou goest to possess it. Yeah, you see, there was a time in America that within the bosom of the Christian dwelt the fire of God. And they kept the commandments of God and they possessed the land. Yeah, that's right. And you'll be surprised when you look back at the early days. Like, you know, one, one, of the, one of the opposites of what it used to be is Harvard. Now Harvard is the think tank for, for socialism, communism, and everything pagan. Its birthplace was in a Sunday school classroom that as they begin to teach, the president of Harvard wanted to learn Hebrew so that he could speak God's language when he meets him face to face. The first Hebrew lexicon ever printed and developed in America because there was a Jewish rabbi that got to know the people that, began to found, that founded Harvard and began to know the professors. And they had such fire of God in them and such a desire to keep the commandments of God that they led that rabbi to Jesus. And he began teaching at Harvard and developed the first lexicon of the Hebrew language. So we, and, and this is something they don't teach us in history. They don't teach us that the pilgrims came over because they kept the feast and they were trying to flee from being persecuted by the Church of England for being Hebraic. That out of that, those people, because they were walking with Messiah and they were keeping his commandments, that they were able to possess the land, just like God said Israel was going to. There, there is a connection between Israel and America. But see, if you abandon God and you abandon the fire and you abandon his commandments, Nebuchadnezzar will eventually show up. And Nebuchadnezzar, his kingdom included Iran and Iraq. Just kind of just think about that. 
The only reason that Iran will ever do what it wants to do to America is because God's people can no longer possess the land because they no longer have the fire of God nor keep his commandments. In fact, God says, if you, if you don't keep my commandments, the very land itself will spew you out. So we need to understand, fire of God, hearing his voice, and keeping the commandments always equal possessing the land. You take any of those things out of the equation you cannot possess. You end up being a possession of the enemy. Just dealing with what God's word says. If you don't like it, go talk to the author. But I tell you what, he's unchangeable, just like we said this morning. He's unchangeable. You, you, you see, what, what the church has forgotten, this isn't Kmart. This is not Walmart. We're not looking for a blue light special. This is not Burger King where you can have it your way. We serve a God who is unchangeable, unshakable, unmovable. He is perfect. He doesn't have to change. And so when the imperfection begins to move around with perfection, guess which one changes? Now let's go to Acts chapter 2. Now we've already read this once this morning as we begin, but I want to read it again. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Why, why did you have to wait for the day of Pentecost to fully come? I've actually had preachers teach that, that you know, it would, that Pe the Pentecost couldn't come until they were fully in one accord. No, they, they chose they had better be in accord because they knew what was coming. How many know that when Jesus said, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you're endued with power, they got it. Because they were counting the omer they knew. They knew. And I've always wondered how long did it take, you know. Jesus was there 40 days before, he was, before his ascension. Yeah. They had to wait 10 whole days. Yeah. I always think it was months because, you know, two or 3,000 saw him go up, but there's only 120 there on the day of Pentecost. How many know it pays to be obedient? It pays to be obedient. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of, as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them cloven tongues like a fire. We need to understand they were, they were given the fire of God. On that day, because they had been made the Mishkan of the Holy Spirit, they had been made the temple of the Most High God, the glory and the fire of God that used to fill the temple now begin to fill the hearts of men. And one, one thing, now this is one of the principles I have found, is that you, you will ask and it shall be given unto you. Isn't that what Jesus said? Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Every Pentecostal wants to speak in tongues, but they never seek for the fire. Oops. We seek an experience instead of an empowerment. You seek the fire, and then whatever else God wants for you is going to come. But you seek the fire of the presence of God because what we find in Israel is when the fire and the, and the chabot of God filled the temple that all the nations round about Israel feared them. And there is no more fear of God. There is no more fear of God's people in the secular world because we, we have let our fire go out. We've sought an experience and not a fire. How many know that if you have a fire blazing, you can continually have an experience? We need to understand what was going on the day of Pentecost. The fire of God's presence uh, that was on Mount Sinai has now come and filled his people, and the Almighty is now empowering his people to do three things. Number one, to walk in his commandments. That which he gave on Mount Sinai, he moved in to empower you to do what he told you to do. A new nature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. His people were to become a testimony to the power of the kingdom. Most churches today, their testimony is their praise and worship service or their band. Their testimony may be the, the, the building. Their testimony may be the trappings. 
But let me tell you something. The only true testimony of Jesus is what he has done in the heart and how he has changed lives. God could care less if you have a 20-lane bowling alley connected to your church. What God cares about is the transformation in the lives of the people that come because they've been touched by the fire of God. But he said, I want you to go in. Now, when this happened, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, he, he said, you're going to go in and, and preach the gospel into every nation. What was he talking about? Just as Israel went into the promised land, they dispossessed the land. They took it away from the enemy. When I have the fire of God on the inside of me and I'm living those commandments, then I become a testimony. I begin leading people to the Lord. I begin dispossessing what the enemy had taken and took it back for God. That's our call. We can't take back a city and we tell we take back the hearts of those who dwell in the city. Oh, you're not getting it. I don't care if you're a believer and you run for mayor because that may not get it. What gets it is when God begins to take back the hearts of the people. That begins to transform that city. Because we have a lot of Christians that have worked hard to become to be established in government only to find frustration, corruption, and a lot of other things that dim the thing of God because it, it, it takes God possessing the people to take back that treasure that is his to change things around. Now, let me give you a note here. This, this is something to think about because there's a direct connection to the fire of God and holiness. I have taught for years that one of the, 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 one of the primary signs of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was tongues. I'm changing that. It's fire. It's fire. You know why? I've seen too many tongue talkers that didn't have a spark, much less a fire in them. They can rondai, shondai, go, go ride in a hondai, but they can't do anything for God except all they do is gripe and complain and gossip and backbite and then try to have church. No fire. So... The primary sign of the Holy Spirit coming with fire in the life of the believer is a purification and holiness. If carnality continues or if it is amplified in the life of, of the believer, did they receive another spirit? Did they receive another spirit and called it the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Ghost moves in, he starts cleaning up. And what I have found is when you really let the Holy Spirit do his work, he starts pointing you back to the commandments of God. Yeah, that's right. Because he's there to empower you to walk in them, not to dismiss them. That's right. That's good. That's good. Just think about that for a minute. See law right there just for a moment. Now, I want to understand the fire of God. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. We've got a lot of different scriptures we're going to do, and I've got eight pages worth of notes, so we've got, we got some cruising to do this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 4, starting in verse 22. But I must die in this land. I must not go over to the Jordan, but ye, will, but ye shall go over and possess the good land. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he had made with you, and, made, and, and you make a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. The Lord thy God is a consuming fire. The Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now we look back at that and we go, uh-oh. Brother... Aren't you glad that is completely Old Testament? Aren't you glad that's just Old Testament? There's no connection to that with grace, is there? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. If you're, if you're not getting it, I'm setting you up. The writer of Hebrews, which I believe was the Apostle Paul for many reasons. In fact, there's, there is a lot of evidence that Hebrews used to be connected to the book of Galatians. Because he was making an argument that, 
that salvation is not by circumcision, which the Shammai Pharisees was trying to preach among the Gentiles. But then he also, he, he was having to straighten that up, but he also had begun straightening out a lot of things with the Hebrews, and so they were connected together. And he's talking, and he's, he's, he's showing a comparison. Listen, those that were out in the desert that met God at Mount Sinai and the fire fell and all that, and they didn't believe God. How many, many of them died in the wilderness? When God told them to go over the Jordan, they wouldn't do it. They forgot about the fire. Yeah, I'm going to say this because I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but what they forgot was either the fire of God can, can throw through them to consume the enemy or the fire of God can consume you. The very fire that they denied had the ability to consume the enemy, consume them. And so he, he encourages us here, picking up at verse 25, See that we refuse him not that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. How many know we're getting ready to enter into that time? That's right. Baby, there's a whole lot of shaking getting ready to go on That's right. in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, think that, I think we're going to see it within the universe. I think we're going to see it in our solar system. I think there's things going to begin shaking out of place in heaven that are going to alarm astrophysicists. Guys, there's things going on right now with the sun that, 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 right. that, that, that have scientists all shook up. They, now they hide it. They hide it. You've you got you to go into scientific journals to find these things out. How many know the government never tells you the truth about anything? <laughs> They're not telling us the truth about Japan. You know, there's, there's things in, in, in the book of Revelation about boils and blisters, and it sounds like radiation poisoning. Did you know that we, and, and Chad was sharing this with me, that there's reports of, of uh, within uh, Alaskan Airlines, they fly so much in that airspace up above that uh, they're showing signs of radiation poisoning, that their hair's falling out, and they're getting blisters all over their bodies, and they're trying to tell them it was the new uniforms they got. How many know new uniforms do not cause your hair to fall out? Radiation poisoning does. And even in California, there's rumors that they, the doctors are being told not to give people uh, uh, iodine, potassium iodine, for, for radiation poisoning because it will alarm the people. They would just rather them get thyroid cancer and die rather than to cause an alarm because it's beginning to show up in the rain. Is because all that. The, have, you, have you not realized that in Japan, that thing is still melting down? It is still releasing radiation into the atmosphere. Nobody's telling us about it. We're starting to see the things of Revelation begin to come to pass. We are living the Revelation days, if you have not realized it. Well, where are we on the scale? I don't know. I just know I want to be ready. I want to, if you have the fire of God on the inside, you don't have to worry. Because it's either you're consuming or you're being consumed, one or the other. I said, everything's going to be shaken. But this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. God's getting ready to find out who's who. That's right. Sure is. There are a lot of people that call themselves Christians that have left Christianity a long time ago. They still act like they're believers. They still talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Just like in Isaiah, when, when, when God was accusing his people, he said, you act like those who want to hear my commandments, but you don't do them. You've replaced them with other things. You go through the, the form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. Yeah, right. I mean, oh, the church is doing the exact same thing. Verse 28, wherefore we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace. I mean, that sounds like New Testament. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with hoo-hoos and ho-hos. Is that what the word says? No, sir. With reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. You see, it is the God of the Old Testament that we serve. And I love what the brother has done in the book, Who Ate with Abraham, because he shows the God of the Old Testament is Jesus. 
that he is a God who burns with fire. In fact, in Ezekiel, there's the, I think it was Ezekiel or Isaiah where he saw the Lord. That's Jesus. There, there was, I, I, I like what the good rabbi calls me. He said he was an atomic man. <laughs> he was like an atomic explosion sitting on the throne, burning from the waist up and from the waist down. That is the God that we serve. He is a consuming fire. Guys, when we hear the voice of God, we're able to possess the land, we're able to walk in the kingdom, and we always must have reverence toward God and remember that he is the one doing the work. Oh, this, the, Mike, you, you, don't, you don't understand, this really isn't talking about, uh, you know, no Baptist would ever talk about stuff like this, right? There's a guy named A.W. Pink in his exposition of Hebrews, and I want to read what he said about this verse. For our God is a consuming fire, verse 29. This is the reason given why we must serve God with reverence and fear. The words are taken from Deuteronomy 20, uh, 4, 24, they, where they are used to deter Israel from idolatry, for this is a sin God will not tolerate. And what we have done with our theology, although we may not have carved something, we have carved out cardboard Jesuses that we have made in an image other than God. The real Jesus is seldom ever preached from pulpits today. That's idolatry. And it's also bearing false witness. You are testifying that God is something he is not. The same description of God here is, uh, is here applied by the apostle unto those lacking grace to worship him with the humility and all which he demands. They lack the grace. Those running around talking about grace all the time lack the grace to have the reverence for God they should have. That's right. If we are graceless in our persons and devoid of reverence in our worship, God will deal with us accordingly. Whew. I like this Baptist boy, don't you? We need some more A.W. Pinks in the body of Christ again. As a fire consumes combustible matter cast into it, so God will destroy sinners. The title, Our God, denotes a covenant relationship, uh, yet though Christians are firmly assured of their interest in the, in the everlasting covenant, God requires them to have holy, holy apprehension of his majesty and terror. God requires. Where is the fear of God? There's no fear because there's no fire. Let me tell you something, baby. The fire's getting ready to come. Yes, it is. It's getting ready to come. As far as I'm concerned, it's done been lit right here. He goes on to say, the twin graces of love and fear, fear and love should be joined actively in the believer, and it is in persevering or preserving a balance between them that his spiritual health largely consists. Let me read that again. The twin graces of love and fear, fear and love, should be jointly active in the believer, and it is in preserving a balance between them that his spiritual health largely consists. That if you don't keep the balance, you lose your spiritual health. Thank you. I mean, I, I like A.W. Pink because his brother had some depth. In fact, after graduating from Moody Bible Institute, he looked at the Baptist church and said, y'all ain't walking with God, and he kind of separated himself and just went into prayer and study. Because he, he looked at what was going on in the body of Christ back then and said, y'all mess. And I, I agree with him because right now I look at the body and I say, y'all mess. I can't even hardly stand to watch Christian TV anymore. If you're really walking with God, it depresses you. It, 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 you feel like you're Elijah watching the prophets of Braille trying to have a, TV, have a TV show on Jezebel TV and you not get depressed, you know. Yeah, true. More on the fire of God. Collins, uh, thesaurus of the Bible, provides us some initial insights or additional insights into the fire of God. The fire of God, our God is a consuming fire. This is given over and over again in the Bible. Our God is a consuming fire. 
The light of Israel, Isaiah 10, 17 promises, will become a fire. The light of Israel will become a fire. Jesus said, you're a light into the world. We're, we're to allow that light to become a fire. God also promises, as he said, I will be a wall of fire round Jerusalem and Zechariah 2 and 5. Talking about the hedge of protection. You see, when you let the fire burn here, it'll burn a hedge of protection round about you. When you don't let the fire burn, you put out your hedge. He goes on to say that God is not only uh, like a fire in Ezekiel 1.27 and Ezekiel 8.2, his appearance is like unto fire. It tells us in Malachi 3 and 2 that he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. That's actually talking about Messiah when he comes suddenly into his temple. The Lord has burned in Jacob like a flaming fire, Lamentations 2.3. And he also warns in, in Amos 5, 6, lest the Lord break out like a fire. You're, you're not getting it yet. The fire can either protect you or it can judge you. But the fire's coming. It can either protect you or it'll judge you. Now speaking of Messiah, the fire of Christ... Over and over again in Revelation, Revelation 2.18 and Revelation 1.14 and Revelation 19.12, over and over again it says Jesus has fire in his eyes. When you look at the heart of God, you see fire. Luke 12, uh, 49 says, I have come to cast fire on the earth. Boy, you don't hear that one preached very often, do you? Luke 12, 49 also says, I wish the fire was already kindled. Jesus is longing to get this thing over with, get it done. When the Lord is revealed, when, G when the Lord Jesus is revealed in a flaming fire, 2 Thessalonians 1 and, 5, uh, 1 and 7, when he comes back, he'll be revealed in fire. The Holy Spirit Revelations 4, 5 says, the seven torches of fire, which are the Spirit of God. We talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with fire, with tongues of fire. I mean, no, it's all the same God. He just manifests, but he consistently manifests with fire because fire purifies. Now, there's an, there's an interesting concept. There is a Torah principle. How many know when Jesus came, it was one of the greatest strategic warfare moves ever done by God. Yeah. It was warfare, guys. He came and the whole time when, when it was finally revealed who he was, the devil met him in the wilderness to begin tempting him because he knew it was on. Before then, there is no mention of Lucifer ever coming to Jesus when he was a kid and messing with him. But once he was baptized and the, and the Holy Spirit came on him, ding, 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 ding. The devil got a clue. This one's anointed. The Holy Spirit is there. And so the Bible says the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And the fight was on for 40 days. He won by quoting the commandments of God. Every quote was from Torah. The Bible says he came out of the desert place, out of the day bar, the speaking place, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it was on for three and a half years. And the devil thought he won by crucifying him and killing him. But when Jesus showed up in hell, he didn't show up as a defeated foe. He showed up as Almighty God, and he opened up a can of whoop devil in the pit of hell. The devil began to find out from that day forth what hell was all about. He got, he got the snockers beat out of him, and he got his keys taken away. Because when Jesus rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave, the first thing we see in the book of Revelation is, John, boy, I got the keys. I got the keys. Every time the devil walks, he don't jingle no more. <laughs> Those keys don't jingle no more. You see, it was strategic warfare. And so there, there is a principle of Torah that when you go to war against the pagan and you conquer them and you begin to get back the spoils of war, 
How many know there are spoils of war? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a spoil of war. <laughs> Jesus went to war to get you. And so there is a Torah principle of what to do with what you get out of a pagan area to begin to use for yourself. We find this in Numbers chapter 31 and 23. How many know Jesus wants to be able to use you? He wants to use you. Well, here's how we preach how he uses us. He'll pat you on the head and say, no, nah, I can use you. He'll lay his hand on your head. No, there's something he's got to do first. Verse 23, everything that may uh, abide the fire, ye shall make it go through the fire, and it shall be clean. Huh? Nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water of separation, and all that abideth not the fire, ye shall make go through the water. There is a purification process. And what God was teaching them in this type in this shadow is that there's something about water and something about fire that purifies the plunders of war. Numbers 31, 23. It purifies it. It is a Torah principle. And that's one of the reasons why the fire was given on the day of Pentecost. He had to pass through the fire before you could be used. You had, to, you had to go through the holiness of God before you could be used. Because in that fire, that fire is supposed to do something in you. But, but Jesus takes both sides. You see, there's parts of you that can go through the fire, and there's parts of you that's got to go through the water. Right. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. You see, there's parts of you that can only be sanctified to God by the washing of the water of the word. And there's parts of you that can only be sanctified by the fire of God. And you gotta have both. You see, the early reformers and coming out of the Catholic Church, they, they, they had a, a saying that was called uh, Spiritus Testimony. Uh, it's been so long since I've said it, I forgot it. It's not in my notes. Spirit, uh, come on. I hate that when you can't get the file. Yeah. I've said it a million times. He used to be on my logo. Where's my logo at? <laughs> Sanctimonium uh, Spiritus Sancti, yeah. which, which basically was saying that there has to be a balance of the spirit and the word. There has to be a balance between the water and the fire. Because you get all fire and no word, you get into mysticism. You get all word and no fire, you get into legalism. And we have believers that think they're playing with fire, but they're playing with the wrong fire because the fire of God will always lead you to the water. It's like that vision I had at the beginning of the service today that I saw the temple of God and on the, on, in the Holy of Holies, the, a shaft of fire was coming out of the top. God was restoring the fire to his temple and as he did, water began to flow in the streets of Jerusalem. Because the Bible says when Messiah comes and he teaches there that the Torah will flow from Jerusalem. The water is in the Torah. And we have got to be cleansed by the washing of the water of the word and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because that fire causes us to embrace what the word's doing, what the word's supposed to do. Now, I could get into the whole thing, a strange fire. strange fire will never lead you to the word. It'll lead you away from it. And it never burns up the chaff. It causes the chaff to multiply. That's why God says, don't mess with that. Now, here's one of the, the, the conundrums of life for the believer. We can either allow the Holy Spirit to burn within us to purify us, or God is forced to use the circumstances of life to burn things out of us. 
We can either allow the Holy Spirit to burn within us to purify us. You see, if the Holy Spirit's burning within you, it causes you to cast off every weight that so easily besets you. It causes you to throw out the junk. But if I refuse to throw out the junk, if I refuse to yield to that fire, God says the only other fire that I can release in your life is the, is the fire of persecution. And one of the reasons why persecution is getting ready to come on a church in America is we have been playing with the wrong fire. We have been playing with a fire that, that inflames carnality. That's why sin is so rampant in the church. And because we're not dealing with God's voice, God's fire, and God's commandments, we are being dispossessed. It, it, it is no secret why that the early church and the apostolic fathers all believed that the tribulation period was for the purification of the church unilaterally. There was no concept of the pre-trib rapture anywhere in it. The only way that proponents of the pre-trib rapture could get some of their sayings, they got to take it out of context and turn it sideways. It's not there. Now let me tell you something. In the, in the midst of being persecuted by Rome and all the things that they were going through, they said, you know what? And th this was from their viewpoint of, uh, uh, of either where they were or they were going to perceive where they were headed. But they're looking out of that and say, you know what? It's going to take persecution to get this thing cleaned up. They said that when Christianity was illegal. Can I get, and, and <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say this. The, the, the proponents of the pre-trib rapture always talk about the first loaders and the second loaders. Let me give you a clue. There ain't no first loaders. There's only one train. <laughs> and the only ones that get to go on the train are the ones who are pure. See law. Now I want, I want to teach you a principle about the fire. Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 through 25. This is the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. If you, if you don't know the story, Nebuchadnezzar had built an idol. He says when the music plays, everybody's going to bow down and worship this idol. And I guess that Daniel was out of town on business during this thing because he wasn't among them or he'd have been, he'd have been sticking up like a, a sore rabbi right in the middle of it too. He wouldn't have done it either. But history friends, when all the music sounded, they wouldn't bow down. And so it's told to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar said, I told everybody I was going to kill you if you didn't do it. I love their words. O king, God is more than able to deliver us. But I tell you what, if he don't, I ain't bound. I'm not bound. Right. I ain't afraid of your fire. I got his fire. That's right. So we pick up here. In verse 19, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his, of his vestige was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the, and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flames of the fire slew those who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You need to underline that in your Bible. That fire killed some guys. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the fiery, burn, a burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast in men, three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loosed. I see four men loose. I see four men loose. I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth man is like the Son of God. Now, here's what God was telling me, because uh, uh, um, yesterday I was praying to seeking his face, and God says, you need to talk about fire. And I said, cool. And he says, no, he says, you don't understand. This is the question he asked me. 
Why did the fire kill some men and then set others free? You see, the fire that's getting ready to come on the earth is the fire of God. And let me tell you something. It's going to be waxed seven times hotter than this earth has ever seen before. That's the whole reason behind the book of Revelation. Seven times hotter. Some men that fire is going to kill. Some men that fire is going to set free. And the only difference between the men, because how many know Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were mighty men of the Lord? Both of them were mighty men. The only difference, the answer lies in whom the men were serving. You see, you and I were made to live in fire. <laughs> if, if that fire was made to dwell within my bosom because of what Messiah has done, that fire burns off everything that has ever held me back. And I can walk about in the midst of that fire loosed with Messiah walking with me. And that very same fire will kill those who from their heart aren't serving him. That may be the reason why the fire came in one service and Ananias and Sapphira ended up being carried out. They were literally slain in the spirit. <laughs> Permanently. Because the fire of God was there. And who they served from their heart was manifested in what happened to their flesh. Either the flesh dies in the fire and you're made alive in God or the flesh and everything in you dies in the fire. Guys, God is getting ready to show up as El Shaddai again. And as I shared, I can't remember it was last because I've had to go back and reteach for lesson three, and then I taught lesson now. So I've taught lesson three, then taught lesson four, then I had to go back and reteach lesson three. So I'm not sure where it falls. But when we studied El Shaddai, not only is it God the all sufficient one, it can also be translated God my destroyer. God my destroyer is getting ready to come. And his fire will destroy the works of the enemies and those that do wickedness. It will burn off the bondage the enemy has placed upon God's people for refusing to compromise. Here's one of the quandaries. We think sometimes bondages come because you just got sin in your life. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were bound up because they refused to bow. It was their uncompromisingness to the king of uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the devil had to try to do something to bind them up because they were trouble. And for some Christians, bondages come because you had sin in your life. And for some believers, the enemy came in while you were young to bind you up because you were anointed. Let that sink in for a minute. Why did the devil so concentrate on you when you were a kid and had things to try to bring bondages into your life? Because he saw the fire of God in your heart. Yes, I see. I, I've always wondered why did the devil attack some people and not others? You know, even as kids, he had attacked them. Because when you see in the spirit, you see different than you do in the flesh. The Bible tells us that when we go to heaven, how I many know when you get to heaven, you're completely seeing in the spirit? The Bible says you are going to know as you are known, that you're going to see what's really there. And I think that a calling of God can be seen from birth. We also know the devil even tries sometimes, I think they can even see it when the mother's carrying the child because there's sometimes he's tried to kill the child before they were born. We see that in the Bible, we see it in real life. And so whether your bondage came by sin, if it does, you repent and God will break it off. But if it was put there from the devil to keep you back, you need to rejoice in the fire of God because it will finally burn off what the devil tried to bind you up with so that you can walk free with Jesus in the midst of the fire. That fire will burn the chaff out of the believer's lives that have tried to sidestep his sanctification process. Ouch. I like what uh, Joyce Meyer says when he talks about pruning. You know, Jesus said those that, that bear fruit will be pruned. Those that don't bear fruit will be pruned. You're pruned if you do and pruned if you don't. But the difference is either getting, either getting you know, a little snip here or there or getting pruned down to the nubbins. You know what I mean? And the fire of God that's coming 
it's either going to set you free, or then there have been a lot of believers that really made Jesus the Lord and Savior of life, but they have sidestepped sanctification their whole life. They're about ready to have a fiery pruning coming. So if you get with it now, you won't have to get with it then. Because God is going to have a holy people. I know years ago, and there, there's only two or three times that I've really had what I call prophetic, prophetic visions. Like there are some that you have, like, I can, like today when we were praising and worship, I saw that. But that doesn't take the dimension of actually having a vision from God. That it, it, it becomes an encompassing vision. Whenever you have that, that vision is more real than this is here. It's more real. The colors are brighter. The colors have more depth to them. And one time as I was praying, God, let me see the mercy seat in heaven. I saw the blood of Jesus on the mercy seat, and that blood is alive. The Bible says that it speaks better things than that of Abel. And that blood was saying, I will have a people, and they will be holy. I will have a people, and they will be holy. We're all going to have to pass through the fire. First Corinthians tells us that as we all pass through the fire, some of us, everything that we did in life, none of it was really for God, even though it may have had the appearance on the outside to be for God. It's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to be gone. Only those things that were forged in the fire for God, that he became a refiner's fire and a fuller soap, become wood or become uh, silver, gold, and precious gems. Do you ever think what, if you're going to have a crown to, be, to wear when you first get to heaven, it's got to be forged out of something. Gold and silver and precious gems. You see, you never appear before the Lord empty-handed. Never, ever. And so our lives are going to be judged by fire, whether in this life or this life to come. And sometimes I wonder if it isn't both. I, don't, I, I really believe in every generation there is a trial by fire that comes to the life of every believer to see what you're made of. But there's also a fire to come. And as I yield to God, I have something to construct a crown out of so that I have something to cast at his feet. You're not going to be walking around heaven saying, see my crown? No, you get to see it formed by the Holy Spirit into something that Jesus has done in your life so that you can cast it at his feet and say it was by your grace. It was by your work. You alone are worthy. You are holy. Let me tell you something. That's one time when you show up to church, you don't want to end up with nothing in your wallet. You don't, you don't want to end up with nothing to cast before the Lord. Because then, I mean, then it's, it's, it's time for the truth to be revealed. Some people are going to be saved as by fire. But literally, they have nothing to cast at the feet of the Messiah because they said, other than salvation, you didn't get anything done in my life. I'm just here. Oh, I want to have something to cast at his feet. You've got to embrace the fire. I want to close with this. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 and 2. Because this talks about the return of the Lord. And people try to use this to express the imminent return of Christ. Has, it isn't even talking about that. How many know that, that if you've ever studied Hebraic heritage, there are, there are Hebraic colloquialisms. There are, there are sayings. There are, there are trigger phrases that connect to something. It's like if, if a Jewish person would say, you know not the day or the hour... If, if, I had, if I had a large congregation here and 80% of them were Jewish and 20% of them were Gentile and didn't know, when I said that, every Jew would know I was talking about the Feast of Trumpets. Because that's the expression directly connected to the Feast of Trumpets. When you talk about the thief in the night, that refers specifically about the duties of the priests in Jerusalem in the night watch. Now let's look at this. But at the times and seasons, brethren, I have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves perfectly know that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
And so we evangelicals say, it can come at any time. It can come at any time. As you walk into that movie house, watching that which you're not supposed to watch, he could come right at that minute. Ah! Don't have an organ, but come on now. But we forget that that is a Hebraic expression. At, at the altar of God, the fire had to burn 24-7. It had to be kept alive 24-7. And so there were priests, there were Levites that were assigned to keep the fire burning. You see, we now have a priesthood of Messiah. We're after the priesthood of Melchizedek. God gave the fire. How many of us have ever had God just really touch us and there was some fire with it? He gives it to you. But you're the one to required to keep it burning. You got to keep it burning. And see, that was the job of that priest. He would, he, would, he, he would be required to watch that fire all night long and stoke it when it needed to be stoked in the midnight hour. Because it's in the midnight hour when the flesh gets weary that you can let your fire go out. Uh-oh. Think about that for a minute. And he's describing when the Lord comes back, it's going to be in the midnight hour when the flesh is going to want the fire to go out because we quit tending the fire. And so in the middle of the night, sometimes two or three o'clock in the morning, and he said what a lot of the new newbies would do is, boy, they would stoke up that fire and they would pile wood on it and wood on it and wood on it and wood on it and say, boy, this baby's going to burn all night. And then they would kind of sit down and just kind of watch the fire And about 2 o'clock in the morning, and the high priest would show up. And how many know they, they wore garments all the, way down the, the, and the, all the way down to the floor? All you get to see were their toes, you know? And so they would be all snuggled up, and that high priest would just take some of the coals. And he'd go and he'd lay it at their feet between the, the garments, and that would get them snugly warm. <laughs> and the high priest was as a thief in the night and just standing there watching and all of a sudden the guy woke up with his drawers on fire <laughs> and so what do you do when your clothes are on fire he became a streaker and the boy would have to run home naked and his shame, his nakedness was manifested to everyone because he wasn't tending the fire. Oh. <laughs> Jesus says when I come back, there's going to be a lot of priests that haven't tended the fire. And I've already warned them that their nakedness is going to appear, that they weren't prepared. That's the connection between when the Lord returns, there's going to be a lot of priests that are asleep at the fire. And they've allowed the fire of God to go down. You see, everything about the world is Satan hates that fire because that fire not only keeps you empowered, but keeps him judged. And the only way that he can begin moving is he's got to let the fire go down. The only reason we have the darkness in the earth today is the church is asleep at the altar. That's the only reason. And then we have those, well, brother, I know prophecy. I'm just going to have to sit here and just snore and just let the Lord just finish his work because, you know, it's just got to get real bad. <laughs> Not knowing it's an indictment against him. Right. It's time to wake up from slumber. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul says? High time to wake up out of slumber. It's time to start stoking the fire again. You may say, Brother Mike, in my life tonight, or today, well, I'm really planning on preaching a long time, aren't I? Tonight. <laughs> all I got are the embers. I used to have a fire, but all I got is the embers. I've got a prophetic word for you. The Holy Spirit is here to blow upon the embers. The Holy Spirit is here to blow upon the embers. He wants to help you out. That's right. 
This was a clarion call not only to understand the fire of God, but to wake up and start stoking the fire. You know what you need to do to keep the Holy Spirit stirred up on the inside, to keep that gift stirred up. Every one of us is different, but each one of us has something that stirs the fire. Have you ever played with a fire? You know, it kind of goes down, and you'll take a stick, and you'll kind of stir up the coals, and next thing you know, it catches fire again. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he told Timothy, stir up the gifts that are on the inside of you. Some of us, it's music. Some of us, it's preaching. Some of us, it's just getting along with God. Whatever it is that stirs the fire, it is time to get stirring. Because we have, right now, we have a special window of opportunity. The Holy Spirit is saying, if you stir it, I'll blow upon it. If you stir it, I'll blow upon it. But he won't, he won't release the wind of heaven unless you stir it. Isn't that really what Jesus was saying to the letters, to the churches, when he said, go back and do the first works? Go back and get the stirring once again. Go back and get the stirring. You've lost your first love. Go back and get the stirring so that I can blow on the embers of your fire so that the fire of my Holy Spirit can be stirred up in you once again. That is the job of every one of us. That's part of our priesthood is to keep that fire stirred up. Don't let it go out. Stoke it. Stir it up. Shake it up. Walk it off if you have to. I remember when I was in the military and they, you know, they, they wake you up three o'clock in the morning, make you run before breakfast, make you run two, three, four miles before breakfast. Then in the afternoon as you were, as you were going through classes, you were going, yeah. and the only time you never got in trouble from the drill sergeant is if you'd stand up. Everybody else was sitting down, but he knew what you were doing. You were, you were so intent to receive the instruction, you were not going to let somber interfere with what you're doing so you would stand up. And let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit's waiting for a lot of people to stand back up. That's right. That's right. God's waiting for you to stand back up, to not let slumber take a hold, because everything of this world is trying to get you to go to sleep so that you don't tend the fire. That grace is here this morning. That's what the Holy Spirit was doing during the praise and worship. Yeah. He was blowing yeah. on the fire. That's right. He was blowing on the fire. I want every head bowed. Father, we just come before you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we repent of not tending the fire that you have placed on the inside of us. Father, we're sorry. We didn't know. We had not been taught. We've got so caught up in the religious games that we didn't know the duties that we had in the kingdom. But Father, right now we just stir the coals and Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would begin blowing on that fire right now in our lives. Father, blow on those coals. Father, during this Pentecost season, blow on the coals. We're not waiting for the fire to fall from heaven. Father, because that fire has been here since that Pentecost. And when every believer is born again, the fire is given. But Father, we ask that the wind of your spirit would begin to blow. And Father, give us the grace, give us the twin graces of love and fear to tend the fire. Because it's time for the health of our spiritual lives to be restored. Lord, come and blow among us. Lord, come and blow on those embers. Father, for some of us, the fire is almost completely gone out. But Father, we stir those embers and we ask that your spirit would blow. Father, catch us a fire once again. Father, we're not looking for revival as the world talks about revival, most of the church. But Father, we want to be soldiers in your kingdom that has the fire of God burning in our eyes because we want to be like Jesus. If Jesus has the fire of God burning in his eyes, we want the fire of God burning in our eyes. So, Father, that whenever the devil, devil ever stares us down, what he sees is the fire that is going to consume him. 
Oh, Lord. If we could just have the praise and worship team come up, let's, let's sing something and just stay before the Lord for a few moments.